Which is really funny because I love having, I think yeah. Sue's been in the room when I've had the argument with people about what is the definition of the word monster. Oh, that's context. in my notes. Is that in your notes? It is. Sarah's turn. I'll shut up. Okay. Oh my god. No pressure. Okay. Oh my god. We want to know what my notes say? <laughs> I wrote an oration. I mean... On monsters? <laughs> on fan monsters in high fantasy. In high fantasy. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I was talking about always since, since the inception of the genre, it's with the roots in mythology and folklore and Gilgamesh and Beowulf and C.S. Lewis, we have seen monsters and why? And what makes a monster? And I actually, oh, you're going to kill me, but this goes back to Tolkien. <laughs> no! We're talking about Tolkien in a high fantasy panel? I am, I am. I'm oh, shocked. So, I mean, I mean, I talked about Grendel some and screw tape letters and all that, but then we're going to gloss over that. <sighs> Grendel so and, and we're going to jump to. <laughs> We're going to jump to uh, trolls, orcs, you know, and then we have Smeagol. Mm -hmm. He's like the perfect example of what is a monster. I mean, yeah. Gollum is a monster, Smeagol is a hobbit. What makes a fantasy creature different than a monster? And it seems like there's like a corruption or a darker side that mm -hmm. kind of comes into it, that comes into play. And then why does fantasy consistently embrace these monsters, and we do. I mean, pretty much every fantasy series, you've got monsters. <laughs> well, yeah, partly because that's a lot of fun. If you're if you're going to create, if you're going to create your own universe, you might as well put some wings and tentacles on something and have I it attack. It goes a little deeper people. than that. Right? While you're there, why not? It's part of the I, I do it. I think it goes deeper than that, though. I think that yes, that absolutely. Fantasy is really a portal with through which we can address some of the questions that plague humanity and some of our our. our <laughs> the deeper trends that we see, and how we reason, and what makes us us, um, in a more palatable way, we can kind of, you know, look at that darkness, and um, what's darkness without monsters, so. Well, I would, I would say that darkness is the monsters. <laughs> it, mo the one, there, and there's about 18 different ways I could define this. One of them is monsters are the way that we create physical manifestations of the darkness. I agree. Of the different kinds of darkness. Um, one of the things I love about arguing about what is a monster is, does a monster have to look bad? No. A, a, per, a, a humanoid who's got two arms and two legs and head and the, eye, the right number of eyes in the right place and blonde flowing hair and a nice tan and suit can still be a monster. And frequently mm -hmm. those more compelling monsters because they are even more relatable to what we see every day. Yes. There is something wonderful about, about fantasy monsters where you fall for the, the facade. The facade is not the monster, it is the actions, it is the intentions, it's what's behind the makeup, essentially, that defines whether that character is a monster or not. So, we talk about, you know, 17 tentacles and 14 eyeballs and things like that. The, but we love those. <laughs> a, 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 fe a fellow author um, that I was having this discussion with broke it down really quickly. Is Chewbacca a monster? No. No, he's a hero. He's a sidekick hero. He's awesome, he's not a monster. Is he seven and a half feet tall, covered with fur, and, you know, rips your arms off? And, yeah, well, yeah. It doesn't make him a monster. It's a definition of a monster that they're bad. No. Because I have a clan of goblins that they still have attitudes, but they're good. So do the goblins think they're monsters? Probably not. No. The, it's like the, the villain never they, thinks... They don't like human. Well... The villains don't think they're the bad guys. My good the, clan does, but... It's the same thing as saying, is every, is, does the villain know they're the villain? No, the villain thinks they're doing something. They think they're the good guys. They think they're misunderstood. Yeah. It, 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 not all of them. Not well, evil all. for evil's sake is not a very Actually, the, story. Most, the, most, the scariest villains are the ones who think that they're the good guys. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, exactly. Yeah. I, I have a copy of Hitler's um, staff meetings, and it's not complete for obvious reasons. But the scariest <laughs> meetings, the scariest meetings are the ones that were just before the fall of Berlin, where he's musing with Goebbels and a couple others, and you really understand a sense that they thought they were the good guys. Yeah. They thought they were doing good. Yeah, when 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 Darth Vader said, I want to bring balance to the galaxy, he wasn't lying. That's, right. That was his motivation. When Saruman said, dude, we're going to lose, we need to lose well, yeah. to Gandalf, he wasn't, Gandalf never Thanos. said you're lying. <laughs> Thanos. Thanos is like, I'm going to yeah. save half the universe from the other half of the yeah. universe. These are great motivations for, for villains, and we, being the people who get turned into powder and disappear, we think this is evil, that's, a, that's another one of those hour-long conversations that never end. So, Mike, yes, sorry, yeah, go sorry. ahead. It kind of goes back to 
it goes back to the yin and yang. There's light, there's dark. Mm -hmm. You can't exist without the other. In dark, monsters are created. Monsters are something that's created. Evil is and it exists. Light is and it exists. And they both create. These are what they create. Our darker fears are what create our own monsters. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So every time we get one of those monsters with the tentacles and the fangs and everything else, those are our deep fears. Mm -hmm. And that's what that's what we perceive. But yeah, just because something looks different doesn't mean it's a monster. Just like tree. So I like that idea. That was very Yoda, by the way. And I mean that as a compliment. I'm not mocking. That was very Yoda, and I'm totally down. I always think, it, I always think the tentacles and this outward um, appearance makes them more accessible to us because it's less scary. So we can put more of our fears into it mm -hmm. because it's not as familiar. It's not we're not looking into a mirror anymore. We're we're describing something other. Um, yeah. And I love that as a fantasy author. I love that it, it's, it gives me so much freedom to be able to address things that I wouldn't outwardly write an essay about mm -hmm. in my book. Right. But uh, you know, I have this. <laughs> I'm writing about trolls. Mm -hmm. So yeah, trolls are this and trolls are that, and you know, and, and I'm able to put all of this. All this stuff, like there's a whole big um, talk about how politics doesn't belong in science fiction fantasy. That's all it is. Yeah. It's all it's ever been. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's, yeah. Like you don't read fantasy if you think that politics has never been. And hopefully you're doing it without thinking about it. It's just part of you. Right, right. I didn't mean to. I didn't. I mean, I've seen some of my reviews on my book and I'm like, I, I didn't mean to do that. Yeah. I mean, but I did. <laughs> but see, that's what makes it good. Mm -hmm. Those who start out with an agenda have to be really... Right. Well, then, all, ultra good, or the book's going to well, stop. Then you, then you end up in like parable yeah. territory, and a parable is something that comes across as um, patronizing a lot of the time. Oh, yeah. yeah. You're like, okay, don't, yeah. come on. Oh, no, Tolkien hated allegory. Yes, he uh -huh. did. He hated yes. allegory, famously hated allegory, and parable, mm -hmm. and, and moralizing. He always defined Lord of the Rings as being applicable, applicable right. which is a brilliant way of saying these are human stories. You're a human audience reading a human story. I'm a human writer. Get over it. Everything, everything's in it. If you write, if the story's long enough, you eventually hit politics and religion and culture and death and birth and family. And I always say when I'm reading something, and if there's politics in it, if there's you know, religion or whatever, if I'm not hit over the head with it, if it's not totally obvious to me, it's just a part of the characters, a part of the world, whatever. It's much better than if you know. They say, this character is, you know. And it needs to be a part of the world, otherwise it's not a very Well, yeah, um, no, but I'm saying world, some, people, but some people make it so much a part that you can't escape it. Right. I think one of Stephen King's, part, sorry, right? yeah. I think one of Stephen King's agents said, the story is the boss. Yeah. It's about the freaking story. No, the story is always the boss, in my yeah. opinion. Yeah. yeah, and also one of my, speaking of stories, some of my favorite stories from science fiction and fantasy, any kind of fantasy, are when, um, the, the protagonist essentially is forced to deal with the fact that the enemy isn't an enemy. They're just a competitor or there's a misunderstanding. They have to go absorb themselves into that culture and they start, you know, the going native thing. We call it going yeah. native as if that's a bad thing. No. Going native is not a bad thing. Okay, dances with wolves. He's not going native. He grocks them. They're not the enemy of the cavalry. They live there first. They have their own culture. He understands them better than any other white man, sorry. Um, right. Those, those um, you know, the joke from Star Trek about sending Kirk to go be the negotiator with the Klingons because only Nixon can go to China. That's literally what Spock said. And it's like, duh, of course, it has to be Kirk. Because Kirk is the worst person to send, it's, which makes it the most interesting story. Yeah. Is that Kirk goes, well, these Klingons suck less than I thought they did. <laughs> <laughs> Anytime you do that, like um, the... Tolkien does this really well with having the elves and the dwarves hate each other. For thousands and thousands of years they hate each other. Team dwarf. Hmm? Yes, she's team dwarf. <laughs> so, you get any of those t-shirts made? Sorry, <laughs> I really should. Let me know when the t-shirts come out. But anyway, so back to the monster thing. There's a, um, there's a term, I don't know if it's an official term, but it's monsterizing. Somebody made that word up. And monsterizing is basically the idea that you are signaling to your audience that this person is the monster. Not that they're the creature, not that they're the Wookiee or the Orc or whatever, but that they are the monster. The monster, and let me clarify, very different from being the dragon or the shadow, if you know your Jungian archetypes. So this is not a head bad guy, it's not a boss or a big bad, it's just something in the way of the hero's journey. 
and they are, you know, um, they're willing to do naughty things in order to prevent the hero from being successful. So monsterizing is that weird way that we signal as creators that this, whatever it is, is the monster. And there's a very, very bad movie in which the way you know who the monster is is that his knees are the size of basketballs. That's it. He looks like a normal person, but his knees are this big. Okay. And 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 this is mystery science theater oh, stuff, okay. right? Yeah. And the mystery science theater guys are going. He's. You know how you tell he's the monster? Look at his knees. And I was like, <laughs> Yeah. That's the only reason his knees are that bad. Is that's that subtle signal that he's the one that will stab you in the back when you turn your back to him. That's it. And he was. He was. He was the. The, he was the, the monster, literally. Yes, sir. Good question. I, you know, you spoke about monsterizing, but, you know, a lot of these different, you know, elves, uh, goblins, trolls, you know, have a long history and lore from all over the world. And, you know, what do you think caused people to, you know, of course there was a fear of the dark, there was an ignorance uh, of science and, and anything like that. But what do you think caused people to take these fears and, and, and place them into such specific forms and, and why it's so widespread and so common oh, that you man. have so many? That's a very long question. Yes. Did you know what I mean? You guys will have to cut me off on that. It's a very good well, question. Yeah, well, I mean, that's just, those things are used helpful. in fantasy now. Right. Well, well fantasy Absolutely. has its roots in mythology and folklore. Right. I yeah. mean, so, so, yeah. I mean, um, I think that's a multi-pronged answer. Right. <laughs> well, let me let me throw out a, a simple beginning to this answer, which is um, every culture on the planet has werewolves. They're not all called werewolves. They're not all literally wolves. But why? Why does every culture have werewolves? It's because werewolves are a, a wired symbol. We're back to the Jungian archetypes for that fear that animal that the animal part of us is in charge. It's the fear of the animal in every one of us. And so every culture literally has a story in which a person turns into an animal. That's very good. Right? So the monsterizing of a werewolf is the hair and the claws and the teeth and you know all that yes. stuff. But it's not just wolves. Um, there are, there are I, I'm not, not going to get into this, but there's examples of, like you guys have heard of lycanthropy, like, right? That was a term. But there's a larger term which is, if I can pronounce it correctly, it's antheriope, I think. Which literally is the is the every animal is from every it's it's a person turning into an animal. Like the were tigers and all. Were tigers, were wars, <laughs> were rats. If you play D and D, you ran into yeah. these these weird things all the time. Great Sheriff in Kenya. Yeah. yeah. Oh. There you go. So that's one example of the 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 antheriope in our in every culture is because it is natural for us to be worried about am I is this is the, is the human brain in charge or is the crocodile brain in charge? Yes. The answer is. Me? <laughs> so we have these great stories. I just have a personal epiphany about why I could not answer that question. I don't see things in distinct terms like that. Everything to me is a spectrum. So, okay. so I've never been I've never been afraid of my primal side because that's just another part of me. Yeah. So. Well, Bjorn. Yeah. Great answer. <laughs> Bjorn was not evil. Mm -hmm. No. No. In, in fact, I don't judge. I was watching Desolation of Smog last week, and. The, <laughs> The Bjorn part. Yeah. I like that. I, I love the, that. Bjorn I love is interesting. That. Well, well, different panel. Uh, yeah. Bjorn <laughs> is Bjorn is great in this context because is he a monster? Oh, no. He is if you're an orc. Well, yeah. Right. It's, it's, this it's is so mo be monster is valid depending on your point of view. This is very subjective. It's the orcs think he's a monster and they're right. Yeah, to them. He's got reasons to be yeah. with them. Get, get, <laughs> yes, justifiable yes. monster. Just, justifiable monsterism. Uh, copyright me right now. The, uh, <laughs> thank you. Gandalf. That's why I'm here. Gandalf sees him as being a person mm -hmm. who has interesting qualities. That's that's one of Gandalf's yeah. superpowers. Is he sees the person in everyone. Mm -hmm. um, the dwarves are like, uh, is he going to eat us or not? And so they find out by you know having Gandalf be kind of like. The, the mediator between those two cultures, they find out he's just a guy who's just he's just kind of angry, again for good reason, and they are able to placate him. And in the movie, he literally says, "I hate dwarves, but I hate orcs more." I'm, I'm paraphrasing a little bit. That's that's they shorten that conversation a lot in the movie. But he's going, 
okay, I, I'm going to help you guys because it works, or much worse than you guys. I'm going to help you against them. Uh, but it's, yeah, it's, a, it's an example of, is he a monster? He's on the spectrum. He's on the monster spectrum. The monster spectrum, I like it. So did we actually answer the question? Yeah. I don't know if we did. I don't know that you can answer that question, to be honest. Yeah. I mean, yeah. that's, a, well, I, that's a sociology you know, question. It goes back to yeah. the, the whole you know, quantum physics thing of you know, everybody's reality is unique to them. And, mm -hmm. and then, you know, there's perspective. As she was saying, you know, your reality is my reality. Even if you were at the same place as me, doing the same thing, it's different than yeah. hers or yours. Mm -hmm. it's, and I mean, I have a biology degree. And I could take it to a biological level about um, adaptation, and you have the right. same the same traits that evolve in completely isolated areas. Right. And I mean, it's a phenomenon that's been studied thoroughly uh, by a lot smarter people than me. <laughs> so, I but like the same thing about the the, the yeah, you know, we're afraid of a reptilian brain taking over the mammalian brain, and but. There are certain drivers that get us to the same points because we are we're human and we have those mm -hmm. same drives and those same fears and those same yeah. tendencies and so even if you are completely isolated you will come up with the same <laughs> the same point. It's it okay. also makes me think that you know we take the shape of our fears of what's out there in the dark you know because back then there was no ambient light you know a long time ago you know they mm -hmm. had candles and mm -hmm. whatever but you know you. They didn't know really what existed in the dark, and their minds conjured all this stuff, mm -hmm. but they would relate it to, say, maybe like they have a fear of snakes during the day, so it must have scales, whatever it is out there, you yeah. know, because it's, and, and I wonder if that's sort of a, you, you relate it to things that you know, but you put them into a different yeah. context to create <coughs> why did why did demons fear. Why did demons traditionally have bat wings? Because before we knew the difference between a mammal and a not a mammal, bats were in that category of what the heck is that? It flies, but it doesn't have feathers. Yeah. Right? So that just the bat by itself is so scary if you have no knowledge of evolution or biology or any of that stuff. So there's a reason why if you want to get really freaky and monstery, bat wings. Right? Because for some reason that scared us a long time ago and it is a permanent fixture of our scare. It, leathery bat wings are part of the darkness yes. for several reasons, which the biology plays this out. And, and you reminded me of something. We call it darkness. We have a huge vocabulary at our command from hundreds of languages from thousands of years. We call it darkness because that's where it started. Mm -hmm. We were afraid of the dark. Yes. I, I have at least three things on me that make light, including this little freaking thing right here. So why do I still call it darkness? Because that's where this all starts. Yeah. Is outside of the ring of your fire. Yeah. See, I find that fascinating because when I actually had free time, I'm an amateur astronomer, I love being in the dark. Mm -hmm. It doesn't bother me at all. And when your eyes adjust, you'll be amazed how much light yeah. you can see from the stars, especially when the moon's up. I love wandering around in the dark. But, you've, but you have the collective knowledge. The, the, star, the stars? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. The stars are incredibly really. important if you want to be able to feed your children. Yeah. Incredibly yeah. important. Thousands of years ago, yeah. absolutely yeah. one of the most important yeah. things. Because you, you, when you plant, when you when you sow, yeah. it, all that, it's the stars and the moon and everything. But now you've taken that way beyond that context to where, in being an astronomer, dark. Uh, I'm sorry, light is the enemy when you're an astronomer. Yeah. I mean, it, yeah. here in Georgia, we talk about where light can I, where can I go, Greg? Right, where can I go to be able to see the damn meteor shower? Yeah. Because any anywhere within 20 miles of Atlanta, forget it. You got to go up to the mountains, and then even up then, you got to find some place where they don't like street lights yeah. or parking lot lights. Yeah, the, you you have taken the darkness, and you and the and the, the not even the mammal part of your brain, the human part of your brain is completely transcended off into an area where it's when like, I sleep, it's like too dark. I labor at it. I work at it to make sure my bedroom is just as dark as that sucker. Can I got light blocking <laughs> curtains. I put a thing over my yes, baby monitor so that I don't okay. see that. Actually, something that you said. Do I sometimes um, see things. Yeah. Something that you were saying led me to another part of my notes. <laughs> my own company notebook scenes. It tells you what it is. It tells you what it is. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm all one of those. Which is what makes an effective monster in fantasy or any other genre, for that matter. And it is 
in my opinion, it is taking elements of the familiar and then twisting some aspect of it so that it doesn't quite hit all of your expectations. So you're, you're connected and you're grounded and you think it's going a certain way and then there's something in it that, you, that does not compute. Um, and I think that that is probably a... I don't know. Like, like you were talking about the corruption of it, of, of Smeagol in the in the right. ball. That corruption takes something familiar and twists it yeah. into something um, hideous. Exactly. If you, if you think that Gollum is a unique creature, he's hideous. But if you understand that he used to be a hobbit, he's pitiful. Yes. Mm -hmm. And that's even scarier somehow. Yeah. yeah. It's more yeah. disturbing. And because it's even more unpredictable because you're like, okay, what kind of desperation has he been driven to? Yeah. Um, and. I mean, when, whenever I'm writing a monster, I'm, like I said, I have a bio biology degree, so all of my monsters are based on, on creatures. I also did wildlife rehabilitation for a long time, so I have amphibious monsters, and I have, I have all kinds of monsters. But um, You're cheating. I, I'm cheating a little okay, bit. I'm, I'm cheating. cheating. Well, I have my template already there, and I didn't even realize I'm using it until I'm like, oh my god, that's just an upright zebra. <laughs> like, later on. But, but they have their own culture, and they have their own, you know what I mean? It's, it, so... Um, but I do think that that's, that's, that's how you connect to readers in general, is that um, using familiarity and, and then it goes back to the... Um, Tony, could you close the door? To, to the original start of the conversation is what is fantasy, and fantasy is nothing yeah. but the human experience with a little bit of something extra. Thank you. And of course we're closing the door and, we, and, I, and I have to now make the 10 minute left announcement, so <laughs> sorry, but it just got very loud out there all of a sudden. Um, we do have 10 minutes left. Um, this is a conversation that we could have for hours and hours and hours. I have, so this is under the category of paying the bills. Please give Anthony and Suzanne feedback if you really enjoyed this conversation. This is, this is something we could talk about for days, and so we can come back next year and keep having this conversation. If you do, I will show up, I promise. I will make sure she shows up. Um, I live like five miles away, it's not hard. That works, that works. <laughs> so, uh, so one of the things that we're having a lot of fun with here, for those of you that are coming in in the second half, we could start off with Jim and Sarah and I, and that was it. So we just went wherever we wanted. We, we kind of argued about high fantasy, and now we're talking about what is a monster, but I really do actually want to bring us back around to some specific examples that we can, pardon the pun, sink our teeth into. Uh, do you, in your brilliant idea of uh, examples, like for instance, I, I personally am going to bring up dragons for no, just randomly want to bring up dragons. Um, I love the relationship between high fantasy and dragons and the concept of the monster because when you talk, this is another one of those everybody in the world has them, every culture in the world has dragons, mm -hmm. right? And I could do a whole panel on why, and I love to talk about that, but that's not the topic. The part of the interesting thing about the relationship between high fantasy and dragons and the idea of the monster is that it depends on what culture you're talking about. Because in Japan and China, a lot of the Far East dragons are celestials. They're the ones that created the earth or they gave us the oceans. They protect the, the, the weak humans from whatever, blah, blah, blah. They're like the titans and they're, they're good titans. In the West, in Western Europe, you might have noticed that they're a little rapey. <laughs> They're a little steely and rapey, and this is mine, go away, or I'll eat you, or light you on fire. The Western Europeans, I'm not going to get into details, but they, they get a little violent and a little aggressive. Um, the North American Indian dragons are all over the map. Um, the Thunderbird is just a beautiful, beautiful creature. Quetzalcoatl wasn't just a dragon, he was a god. So he got promoted a couple of levels, you know, that kind of, kind of thing. So when you talk about dragons, you have the obvious um, smell, going back to Tolkien, because we have to pay the bills. Um, Smaug is, a, is in, my, in my mind, a monster, not because he's stupid or whatever, it's because he he's so intelligent and he uses that intelligence to manipulate for his own very selfish profit. That is the monster in him, is he is sitting on this huge amount of gold and all these dead dwarf bodies, assuming he doesn't crunch the bones, um, because that's, he's, just, he's, he's completely up for him. There is... In, in our human history, there are hundreds of thousands of examples of people who said, give me everything, screw you guys. And, that, and they are monsters for that mm -hmm. in different ways. Um, so, but you can also go to say, and this is the last dragon I'm going to talk about, is uh, Ursula K. Le Guin's dragons are the most intelligent creatures on the planet, far more intelligent than even the human wizards, mages, excuse me. And I love that conversation that, that Sparrowhawk has with that one dragon, where the dragon's over there going, sure, whatever. Yeah, I'll answer your questions. <laughs> and everything the dragon said was technically correct, but also completely manipulative. 
it was half truths and it was it was subtleties of language and everything. And the fact that she was able to create a character like that was beautiful. But also, that's the way I like to see dragons: is not as monsters, but as another species or race or culture that has its own intelligence, its own culture, its own religion, and for, and and consistently don't upset them. There are different reasons why you don't want to upset them, depending on which dragon you're talking about. But don't upset them. Not monsters, at least not for the most part. I think what makes a monster scariest is that intelligence, and I think in a lot of a lot of the examples in my notes, there's separate entities, separate monsters that embody different things. Like in um, um, Robert Jordan, you've got um, the Forsaken. They're monsters, but they're humanoid, and they're intelligent, and they're terrifying. But then you've also got Trollocs, which you know, I mean, they're they're basically orcs. Um, I mean, <laughs> so, and, they, and but, but they're led by, I forgot what they're called, but... The half-men? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the, the half-men used to be men, and they're definitely monsters. Mm -hmm. The Trollocs, correct me if I'm wrong, somebody, but I think they, I think you find out later that they were basically manufactured. Yeah, yeah. Were, yes. Kind of like the orcs, mm -hmm. different panel. Um, but the Trollocs are manufactured creatures that are intended to be, they're, they're built to be monsters. They're built to be violent and aggressive. But they're violent and aggressive, and they're not nearly as scary as, you know, when you have the, the people who are actually a, a, actually manipulating you and mm -hmm. um, getting into your head. And um, I think almost all of these, like um, in Rothfuss, you've got, you've got, you know, uh, the Skrill and the Skin Dancers, and the, but the fae based creatures that have this ultimate intelligence and can get in there and... and lead you down paths and stuff. That is so much scarier, mm -hmm. um, to me at least. Um, and I, I don't know, there does seem to be a, a good division in a lot of these works between, mm -hmm. you know, the monster that is just, all oh, I'm monster, I kill. And Actually, um, Jim Butcher does a really great job of flipping this over in one of the Dresden novels, where... Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I know where it's coming from now. Now we know who it is. <laughs> it's those breakfast burritos, guys. <laughs> So, uh, in, one of the, in one of the Harry Dresden books by Jim Butcher, uh, there are four different kinds of werewolves in one book. And that's the point. Is he's, not, he's glomming on for a reason. Because the actual werewolves that we think of, the lycanthropes, um, were completely innocent and they were being framed by the human beings who were using cursed artifacts to become werewolves. Which I thought was awesome. Because if you had a belt that would turn you into a werewolf and you wanted to frame somebody, You'd frame real werewolves. Great book, great story. It's a beautiful way to subvert that trope and also to have an interesting mystery built into it. So great, great story. And the division comes from that animalistic side of our own natures mm -hmm. versus the uh, in intellectual side. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, I think. And, and so. I think that it was like for for no for no bit of that book at all was I going. This is really silly that somebody would frame werewolves for being werewolves. No, it's a brilliant move. It's, it's very human. It's very normal to go, the actual monsters are the people that that are others. They're different from me, so they're automatically monsters. Uh, we've seen this throughout human history a gazillion times. Almost that Twilight Zone episode with the big faces where they, they uh, yeah. you're like, he's, he's hideous. Yeah. He looks like a person. Yeah. And all the doctors were had the big faces. Yeah. And there's there's probably a hundred examples from, from high fantasy where they'll have a conversation about how ugly how ugly humans are. Yeah. I love those. I love it when they do that. It's awesome. But you went dressed in files and that makes me think that uh, there's certain subgenres that do kind of lend themselves better and that fantasy noir is really one of those um, to, to the idea of the monster. Um, there's a, a debut author that came out with something called Titan Shade, which everybody should look up Titan Shade. If you look, just look at the cover of Titan Shade. And you see, um, he's got uh, a lot of his his monsters are kind of uh, reptilian or amphibious, and but his monsters are actually less monstrous than the people that they're dealing with on a regular basis. And I kind of love that noir genre for giving us that kind of like gritty ability to take down like humanity. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Talk about how how dirty humanity is. Yeah, um, and it, this this isn't high fantasy, but one of my published shorts. That. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, we're, we get off topic. One of, one of my published shorts is about a, uh, a ghoul who has figured out how to live in modern society. So she is required and forced because of her biology to do things that our culture thinks are really taboo. And she's confronted that and dealt with that. Is she a monster? No. In my opinion, she's the hero of the story. That's how I wrote her to be the hero. 
She is confronted by our modern society sensibilities, which have no idea what she has to go through just to live, just to feed, literally. Um, so you get into the conversation about you get into the conversation about are vampires monsters? Eh, depends on the, they're on the spectrum. Mm -hmm. Depends on the vampire. Depends on depends on their behavior. It depends on their interaction with other sentient beings. That's why I rooted for the dragon in Dragon Slayer. <laughs> because yeah. it was this, this dragon. It may have been a Western dragon. It was killing virgins and all that, but only because they left, they put these women in, in danger. Yeah. But this is a dragon who's it's an animal. It's a dragon who's just being a dragon, trying to feed her young. Mm -hmm. That does that make her a monster? Yeah. You know, does it make a lion or or, or some other creature who might attack a man a monster? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So we're starting to run out of time, but I want to really quickly say yeah. that every time I hear a poacher got eaten by a lion, I'm like, yay, yeah, lions! Yay, yeah, lions! <laughs> yeah, who's the yeah. monster there? The dentist or the lion? Yeah. The dentist. The dentist. No offense, to, no offense to other dentists. It's that one specific dentist I'm thinking about. That's not a thing. So, any, we got a couple of minutes, guys. Any parting shots, any things we, we missed other than the entire topic of the panel? <laughs> no, I think so. I think we talked about monsters. <laughs> Thank you. Please ask the bosses to, for us to do more of this next year. Yeah. I love these conversations. It looks like you guys do too. Okay. Any anything else? Anything we missed? I'm going to let Sarah remind you guys who she is for those of you that came in late. Hi. So re reintroduce yourself to the. the I members. am Sarah J. Silver. Uh, this is my debut novel. It is a comedic fantasy heist about a group of, of grog chugging, baby eating trolls who uh, target the evil corporation, the Covered Bridge, um, for a heist. <laughs> and always hashtag beware the, billy go beware the goats. <laughs> it's, it's, it's my thing, you can look it up. It's mostly me and my, my critique partners plugging my book. But um, that's my debut novel. I was also, um, I had a short story in the Jordan Kahn anthology, and I was a guest at the last uh, Writer's Digest conference, which was a whole lot of fun. So that's me. Hi. And I am I'm Darren Bush. I'm a science fiction and fantasy author, and I also work at behind the table at a lot of conventions in Atlanta. We're gonna go ahead and wrap it up, guys. And thank you so much for coming. Thank you for participating. Round of applause for you guys. We we appreciate you coming. I'm so glad you were here. I was gonna give this big long speech based on this. I was gonna be like, so in the beginning. <laughs> Thank you. So you. You need a little, like, bit of shh. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, let's get out of here. There I was at the back. I did, but somehow they put 2 o'clock on the green sheet for 2.40 on the door. So we had to fix it. So are you going to be in here for two hours? No, we're not. Are you saying it's two hours? What happened then? Thank you. What are we doing in two hours? I'm just trying to